I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio met today with President-elect Donald Trump at Trump Tower. De Blasio told reporters the discussion covered several issues, including immigration. That proposal countered and flew in the face of all that was great about New York City, the ultimate city of immigrants, a place that has succeeded because it was open for everyone, a place built of generation after generation of immigrants. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani says his country remains committed to a landmark nuclear deal regardless of who's in the White House. President-elect Trump has criticized the deal, which caps Iran's nuclear activities. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry today made an appeal to all nations to continue the fight against climate change. At a U.N. climate summit in Morocco, Kerry said failure would be, quote, a betrayal of devastating consequences. President-elect Trump has called climate change a hoax and has pledged to cancel the Paris deal, limiting greenhouse gases. Legendary singer-songwriter Bob Dylan, winner of this year's Nobel Prize in Literature, won't attend ceremonies next month in Stockholm. The Swedish Academy says Dylan told him that, quote, other commitments make it unfortunately impossible. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. Bloomberg Technology is next. I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Cisco shares sliding after the company forecasts a tech spending slowdown on the horizon. The full earnings report ahead. Plus, Twitter suspends the accounts of prominent white supremacists as it attempts to curb abuse and harassment. And famed short seller Jim Chano says Tesla shareholders should, quote, have their heads examined if they approve the pending deal. His full comments ahead. First, to our lead. Fallout from the election of Donald Trump continues to ripple through the tech world, especially when it comes to social media companies. Twitter says it suspended the accounts of prominent white supremacists, among them Richard Spencer, who's often credited for spearheading the so-called alt-right movement that supported President-elect Trump. Twitter also added tools this week to help users better filter out abuse. In a statement, the company says, because Twitter happens in public and in real time, we've had some challenges keeping up with and curbing abusive conduct. We took a step back to reset and take a new approach, find and focus on the most critical needs and rapidly improve. Meantime, Facebook continues to come under fire for allowing fake news to spread in the run up to the election. CEO Mark Zuckerberg has dismissed those claims. Uh, joining me now, venture capitalist Jennifer Fonstad, co-founder of Aspect Ventures, and Sarah Fryer, who covers social media companies for Bloomberg Tech. So Sarah, let's start with you and, and the banning of, of white supremacist accounts from Twitter. How connected is this to the election of Donald Trump? I think Twitter is has, in the run-up to the election, understood that there's been a dramatic increase in hateful conduct on their site. The Anti-Defamation League has run studies. There has been an increase in white supremacist, anti-Semitic, those kind of commentaries. Oh, as a result as a, of Donald Trump sort of campaigning? Just held up by the, the excitement over the election, uh, not necessarily endorsed by Trump, but definitely uh, they have found a way to rally around the election. And so the company was already working on tools to curb harassment in light of that. And I think that the the release, the news that they, they announced earlier this week about some of the more stringent rules that are going to be in place, some of the better reporting tools that people will have, and now they're showing that they're, they can actually take action. And I think that this is all, as you, as you said, you know, something that they've come under fire for in the past. And in the light of the election, they, they really need to take a serious look at it. Uh, it's, for Facebook, it's fake news. There's fake news on Twitter, too. But overall, on Twitter, people are much more concerned about the amount of harassment and abuse. Now, both Facebook and Twitter have been criticized for amplifying the voices that people wanted to hear. Uh, let's take a listen to what Mark Zuckerberg had to say uh, about fake news and whether or not it influenced the election. Take a listen. Personally, I think uh, the, the idea that uh, you know, fake news on Facebook, uh, of which you know, it's, a, it's a very small amount of, of, um, of the content, uh, influenced the, the election in any way, I think, is a, a pretty crazy idea. 
Jennifer, what do you think? How much responsibility does Facebook, does Twitter bear here? Well, I think we're seeing that the election in particular has highlighted and amplified how impactful social media is having, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. And so I think all of these private organizations, and we have to emphasize that these are private organizations, they aren't subject to First Amendment coverage, they're not subject to common carrier rules, but how they, how they think about their impact requires them to reflect on what that looks like. Even if it's a small percentage of that today, how that will change over time and what kind of tools that they can use to, to on a non-arbitrary basis, um, manage um, fake news or harassment or um, aggression through their sites is something that they need to be taking a look at, and I suspect they, they are. It's interesting. Of course, Twitter and Facebook are uh, of completely different sizes. Facebook is enormous. David Kirkpatrick, who did that interview with Mark Zuckerberg and wrote the book on Facebook, uh, suggested earlier this week that Jack Dorsey is taking a much more political stance and where we're seeing Mark Zuckerberg be much more apolitical here. Absolutely. Zuckerberg it's very important to, the, to him personally to appear unbiased. We saw how Facebook reacted to the dispute earlier this year around trending topics when Gizmodo reported that there may be some liberal biases in their, uh, the stories that they selected to be trending. Facebook almost overreacted to that. They, they fired the human editors, they invited conservatives to headquarters to speak with Zuckerberg and learn more about how newsfeed works. This is, this is a very, uh, tricky place for, for Zuckerberg to be in. He does not want to be the arbiter of truth. He doesn't even want to block, uh, you know, biased opinion mongering news, uh, opinion masquerading as news. Those are going to be the most difficult articles for Facebook to try and restrict. Fake news could be easy. Those kind of things that are trying to persuade people are, are going to be a lot harder. Jennifer, do you think Facebook needs to take greater responsibility to add more human editors, human curators of news, more like Yahoo News did back in the day? Well, I think that Facebook has never, has never characterized themselves as a news site. Mm -hmm. It's never characterized itself as, as a promulgator of news. And so I think that putting that responsibility on them from a human editing perspective then actually raises their liability. But the reality is so users are seeing so much of their news through Facebook. I think that's fair and the type of information that's shared. I think actually there may be some automated tool solutions and, and users, don't forget the power of users themselves to be able to self-manage and self-regulate and there's quite a lot of that already today and, and Zuckerberg are, could actually put more tools in place to enable the individuals to be able to manage that as well. But if people are only clicking on stories they agree with, maybe they won't understand what's fake or maybe they have been you know, lacking their own tools to discover what news is or isn't to be to be believed. I think that's a challenge and I think that's a challenge though even before Facebook came along because people often choose to hear information that they want to hear and they choose Fox News over CNN in the same fashion. So how much of that responsibility falls back to Zuckerberg and Facebook versus the individual and the consumer and the education system that we try to where we try to foster um, acceptance of different voices. By the way, Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook, did publicly endorse uh, Hillary Clinton uh, in this particular election. Let's talk a little bit about Snapchat, though, because uh, we've reported now that they have filed to go public. They filed to go public before the election. Is Snapchat facing any of these allegations, or is it, are they in a different place because the content is so ephemeral? The funny thing about Snapchat is it's not feed-based, and in fact, it's not even it's not even one of those situations where you you're really uh, sorting through who to follow. They show you who what to look at. They have their whole Discover channel that has media partners creating content. Um, they have live stories that have that have covered rallies by Clinton and Trump, and both candidates have advertised on the platform. So Snapchat's really um, not been affected by, by this as much. And you're right, it is more ephemeral content that people are sending to, to each other. And so um, and, and internally, I don't think that Snapchat executives, even though they filed to go public before the election, I don't think they're worried about tr a Trump presidency. I, I think everything seems to be pretty much on track over there. Uh, Jennifer, you... Uh you were just awarded VC of the year by by Deloitte, and um, I'm curious how you're see, how you're looking at investing in social media right now. You, uh, you started a, a new fund, Aspect Ventures, a, a few years ago, and given now the power of Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, um, do you see social media as a, a room? Is there really room for growth there? 
I think there's continues to be amazing innovation and I see I think what we're seeing where a lot of the innovation is driving toward is to the conversational user interface so when you think about the messaging platforms most of the innovation that we're seeing and investing in is really moving towards where the consumers are spending their time which is on Slack on Facebook Messenger on iMessenger and so where where we see the opportunity for social media more op applications will be be driven off of building on top of that platform uh, last question to you, Sarah. Quick one. Uh, Facebook also facing allegations about uh, how, well, it's come out saying they've, again, miscalculated the amount of time uh, people are spending on certain ads. It's and been really, I understand, it's a very confusing it's report. <laughs> they're, they're going through, basically, they review their 220 metrics that they give to their partners and publishers, and they found that in four new cases, they actually got their math wrong mm -hmm. in, a, in a couple of, of significant ways where they overstated how much time people spent on instant articles, overstated how much time, uh, how many um, page, how far page reach went, and a couple other things. Um, this is just their attempt to be a lot more transparent about their metrics. And in light of these mistakes, they're going to have a metrics council that meets regularly and gives them advice. All right. Mark Zuckerberg has a lot to think about this week. Sarah Fryer, who covers uh, social media for us. Jennifer Fonstad of Aspect Ventures. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Coming up, we're going to be talking a little bit more about Cisco. Also, billionaire and Twitter investor Prince Alwaleed bin Talal uh, spoke to Bloomberg Television from Riyadh earlier and weighed in on the state of his various investments, namely Twitter. Despite its falling stock price and questions surrounding a possible sale, Prince Alwaleed remains optimistic for the future of the microblogging site under CEO Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey was my friend, Dorsey, just took over a year ago. And he just established many initiatives uh, that related to sports, NFL and otherwise. I think these have to begin some time. I'm very optimistic because you've seen the latest results of, of Twitter. Clearly put the floor on this $19, $20 range, which is our break-even point. So anything above that will be, will be a sweetener for us. Uh, and, you know, we're a long-termer. We still believe that, that the best days are, uh, day of Twitter are yet to come. Still ahead, Jim Chanos, noted short seller and founder of Kinecos Associates, holds nothing back on the Tesla Solar City tie-up and Trump's impact on tech stocks. This is Bloomberg. Tech stocks were hit hard by President-elect Trump's surprise win, though they've crept back slightly in recent days, and many have been questioning what a Trump presidency will mean for technology, specifically Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Kinecos founder and famed short seller Jim Chanos joined Joe Wiesenthal and Scarlett Foo on Bloomberg earlier and asked what President-elect Trump means for big cap U.S. tech. Take a listen. I mean, I think there's some basic narrative about technology and Silicon Valley being out of favor, just as much right. middle America is in favor. But, but again, as we've said, who knows? I mean, it, it, it's too early to tell. But go, prior to this election, I mean, the recent moves aside, did what we see in these uh, big tech stocks look bubbly, like investors were sort of casting aside uh, rationalism about uh, valuations? Well, again, it, it depends. I mean, out. we're stock guys, so it, 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 you know, in the FANG stocks, there's certain things we, we think are overvalued and, and the business models are more questionable and others I think are actually almost borderline cheap. So it, which ones uh, are cheap? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not going to disclose where we are in the FANG specifically. But but the point being is that that I think everything's moving together right now thematically. Right. And I think over time that's going to dissipate and, and the companies are going to be judged on their own merits. But take a look at something like just as simple as net neutrality, mm -hmm. which the Obama administration embraced mm -hmm. and, and, and basically hamstrung the telecom companies to the, to the positive uh, of the internet companies. Um, he's in the past uh, talked about that, that not being fair to the telecom companies. So companies that have uh, benefited from net neutrality um, you know, have, uh, have gotten hit pretty hard. But will he enact anything? We don't know. What do you think about uh, what a President Donald Trump would mean for big deals that are still pending, such as AT&T and uh, its effort to buy Time Warner? Well, well, well again, I think that, that if, we're, if we're right about possibly our populist theory we've been discussing, I think there'll be fewer business combinations. To, that they tend not to happen in those time periods. Um, and he's sort of indicated some skepticism, I think, on a couple of big deals. But I, you know, we're a day away from a shareholder vote 
on the merger of Tesla and a sort of sister company, Solar City. You've been really negative about Tesla and the, the Elon Musk family of companies. The stock, Tesla has come off a bit, but it's still, I mean, very high compared to where it was uh, a couple of years ago. There's still a lot yeah. of faith in the company yeah. to ultimately, you know, sort of change the world, perhaps. <laughs> Um, what do you uh, what do you make of this combination right now? Well, I think the combination is is absurd, and I've said that. So I'll be I don't know if I can sugarcoat it anymore, but I, it's ridiculous. And, and first, Solar's results, while they're not a, a, a rooftop company, just goes to, to show just the risks in, that are inherent. There's deflation going on in the solar business, and and Tesla's taking on these debts. Um, uh, there's negative cash flow at, at Solar City. Uh, the the shareholders of Tesla truly have to have their heads examined if they vote this deal <laughs> in, but they might, and and they very well could. And so um, I that's I think it's going to they're going to rue the day they did it, but but they may in fact do it. Yet what Tesla and Solar City has going for them, Tesla being the sister company of Solar City, is Elon Musk, and he is an incredible master, as you put it, of generating capital, whether it's in the capital Raising markets, capital. Raising capital, excuse he me. He doesn't generate any important, capital. That's important clarification. That's a huge distinction, yes. Raising <clears throat> capital um, in public markets or through private right. investors or through subsidies. What is the story that Musk is telling, and why does he tell it so well? Why is it so effective? You know, I... I I was at a conference a, a few weeks ago, and someone asked me about uh, in Silicon Valley, and <laughs> someone asked me about 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 this merger and 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 the business models of Tesla, and I, I, I made my sort of usual snarky comments about it, and later that night, someone well-known sort of Silicon Valley person came up to me and he started poking me in the chest, saying, "You don't get it," and I think maybe that's part of the problem. I mean. Um, you know, here in Wall Street, uh, uh, we're, we're pretty much focused on numbers and business models and, and is something sustainable. Like cash generation. And, and like cash capital. generation yeah. and do you make a profit and, you know, are you competing in, in competitive businesses? And there it's a much different viewpoint. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost a holistic type of, of a viewpoint. Well, if it doesn't work in this, it'll work something else out. And he's a genius. and. How and is it so far that so far by the way that's been right how is it different than say Amazon which there have been a cert, a band of people on Wall Street say there's no they're completely blowing different. tons of completely money different. and they show growth what's the key difference? completely different and 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 it couldn't be more different and and the when, when both Tesla and or Alibaba get compared to Amazon I, I, I really just have to laugh because Amazon went public in 1996 their last equity offering was in 2001 mm. They have been free cash flow positive every year since then. And, and, and so um, Amazon's business model was brilliant. It was basically the glorified Dell model in which we buy something on Amazon, we, we, our credit card gets charged immediately, mm -hmm. he pays the suppliers mm. uh, his inventory 90, 180 days later. We financed Amazon's growth until very recently. Amazon only has about 20 billion invested in its entire business. Uh, over 20 years. I mean, that's nothing. Bezos' genius was to basically create a platform, much like Apple did, in which basically there were synergies off that platform. Um, Elon Musk is in the car business. He's in the auto business. That's a whole different business. Jim Chanos there, founder of Kinecos Associates. Coming up, Cisco's transition from hardware to network services provider is hitting some speed bumps. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Cisco shares dropping in extended trading after the company reported quarterly earnings and a disappointing forecast. Sales and profit that indicate corporate spending on tech infrastructure is slowing. Joining me from New York, Forrester Research Vice President Glenn O'Donnell. Glenn, thanks so much for joining us. So obviously, Cisco in the midst of a big transition. How would you rate uh, the progress of the transition under new CEO Chuck Robbins so far? Well, we haven't seen the real results of the full transition yet. Uh, a lot is changing at Cisco, and it's something we all have to understand. This is a big, giant company going through some pretty, uh, pretty major changes. And I'm not surprised that Cisco is having some trouble with its earnings and its revenue right now. It is a flattening market. 
but uh, compound that with the fact that Chuck Robbins is indeed changing the company in some pretty dramatic waves, uh, ways. Uh, and he's made some really good progress, I think, in making those changes, but it's going to take some time until we see the residual effects of that uh, and you know, where he's going to take the company into some of the growth areas. Let's talk about cloud computing in particular. Obviously, this is an area where now Amazon, Microsoft, even Google are winning, yet you have some of the older school tech giants like Cisco, HP, Dell, Oracle, uh, trying to take on the cloud as well. Uh, how likely is it that Cisco will find strong footing here? Yeah, we've, uh, we've written on this recently about the, the changing market landscape and how the cloud companies are really getting a lot of the corporate technology spending these days. Uh, and you know that's at the expense of the companies you just mentioned, Cisco being one. Uh, it's, it's a tough market for those players and they all have to transform what they're doing uh, to, to succeed there. And that's not just selling to the, to the cloud providers. Uh, you know, all of this stuff needs technology, uh, but they're not necessarily selling it to the cloud providers. They have to look elsewhere. Uh, some growth areas around Internet of Things, for example, that's going to be a massive uh, force in, in, the, in, in our world in general. And you know, there's going to be a lot of spending there, and that's not necessarily all going to cloud. Uh, companies like Cisco can capitalize on that, but it's a big departure from the past. And okay. it's a big focus of Chuck Robbins uh, with some of his uh, M&A. I did sit down with Chuck Robbins a couple of months ago on the one year anniversary of him uh, taking over from John Chambers. I asked him about uh, the election. Uh, as I understand it, he tr has traditionally voted Republican. However, he would not uh, tell me who he was voting for, unlike uh, many other Silicon Valley executives who came out strongly against Donald Trump. Uh, what would a Trump presidency mean for a company like Cisco that is a global company and obviously has been a bellwether for the global economy for so many years? Um, I don't know that it's going to make that big of a, of a change for Cisco. Uh, you know, President-elect Trump has, an, you know, he's made it pretty clear he wants to build out infrastructure and that could bode well for a company like Cisco. Uh, but a lot of that infrastructure is more the physical infrastructure, highways and bridges and that kind of thing. And there, you got to question how, how much a company like Cisco can benefit from that. Uh, and you know maybe some of the uh, some of the politics uh, of the, the geopolitics of the Trump administration uh, you know, could impact some international trade. But I, okay. I think it's I think people will just come to their senses and do the right thing. Glenn O'Donnell, Forrester Research Analyst there on Cisco Earnings. Glenn, thanks so much. Chuck Robbins will be on Bloomberg Television tomorrow, Daybreak Americas, with our very own David Weston. Do not miss. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with first word news. Syrian President Bashar Assad says U.S. President-elect Donald Trump could be a natural ally to the Damascus government in its civil war. Speaking on Portuguese state television, Assad said his government needs to see if the incoming administration in Washington is genuine about fighting what he called terrorists in Syria. In the run-up to last week's election, Mr. Trump said he was ready to work with President Assad to fight Islamic State. Senate Democrats have elected a new leadership team. New York's Chuck Chuck Schumer will be minority leader. Dick Durbin of Illinois, minority whip, and Patty Murray of Washington State will be the assistant leader. Senator Schumer told reporters Democrats will work with President-elect Trump on issues where they agree, but challenge him when values or progress are under assault. Former French economy minister Emmanuel Macron has announced he's running for president in next year's election. Macron is a pro-EU liberal who's pledged to offer an alternative to both the political establishment and to populists. The European Union's unveiling plans for a new system of security checks to crack down on extremists. People from 60 visa waiver countries, including the U.S., will have to pay a little more than $5 and fill out an online form to obtain clearance to travel within Europe's 26th nation ID check-free area. I'm Mark Crumpton. It's just after 6.30 p.m. Wednesday here in New York, 10.30 Thursday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. 
Good morning, Mark. Let's take a look at the ASX trading for 35 minutes so far and off about two thirds of 1% right now. And not too much happening in terms of gains. Media stocks are doing okay. Uh, James Hardy, the building products company, was out this morning with first half earnings, $144 million there. Uh, BHP Billiton, the big miner, is holding its AGM in Brisbane. And uh, take a look at the uh, other big mining stock in Australia, Rio Tinto. Currently, uh, it's back in positive territory after a weak start. Uh, this is after it sacked its Energy and Minerals Chief Alan Davies. This is in relation to payments of $10.5 million to a consultant in connection with securing the development of an iron ore mine in Guinea. Have a quick look at the uh, NZX in New Zealand. That's looking quite flat. Uh, Nikkei futures expected to be flat as well. Out of Asia today, 10 cents the uh, stock worth watching after third quarter revenue rose 52% to almost $6 billion. And locally here in Australia, watch the Australian dollar unemployment figures, figures due out in a little under an hour's time uh, due to show a rise to 5.7%. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More Bloomberg Tech technology next. This is Bloomberg Tech. I'm Emily Chang. Net neutrality is considered by many to be the Obama administration's signature policy on tech. Remember, this is the idea internet service providers like AT&T and Verizon can't create fast and slow lanes for web traffic, putting companies like Netflix at their mercy. The FCC passed rules in 2015 prohibiting this, but the election of Donald Trump has many industry watchers concerned that net neutrality could end up on the chopping block come 2017. While he didn't have a clear policy platform on the issue, Trump once tweeted in 2014, Obama's attack on the internet is another top-down power grab. Net neutrality is the fairness doctrine. will target conservative media. Joining us now to discuss what may happen to the idea under a Trump administration is internet industry analyst and author Larry Downs. Also with us, with us from Washington, uh, Tech Freedom President Baron Soka. Uh, so Larry, uh, you know this issue inside and out. Uh, the idea is that Trump would eliminate net neutrality. What do you think could actually happen? So I don't think that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think in that tweet that you mentioned was really in response to President Obama's announcement that he wanted the FCC to turn ISPs into public utilities, which the FCC did. Um, that's the part of the ruling in 2015 that I think will go. But I think the net neutrality rules themselves aren't all that controversial. Hmm. They Either Congress or a new FCC may move them back to the Federal Trade Commission, but I don't really think that they're going anywhere. So that means you think it'll remain basically business as usual, no fast and slow lanes? Yes, business as usual for net neutrality. Not business as usual, though, for this reclassification of ISPs as utilities. That, I think, will So go. what would it mean for Netflix? Uh, it won't change anything as far as Netflix is concerned, or for consumers, for that matter. In fact, none of these rules were really being violated in the years before the FCC had rules in the first place because the Federal Trade Commission was already on the job enforcing them. Now, uh, Barron, our Bloomberg intelligence analysts uh, have analyzed, you know, outlined three possible ways uh, that the policy could change. One, through the courts, uh, it, you know, uh, we're expecting Trump to indeed appoint another Supreme Court justice through Congress limiting the FCC's ability or uh, via a, a new Trump appointed chair of, of the FCC, the FCC would then uh, change the rules themselves. Uh, what do you think is the most likely path forward? Well, I think you can count on the new FCC chairman, whoever that is, uh, as Larry says, to start undoing the legal claims of authority that underlay the, the two open internet orders we've seen. And once that happens, uh, I think that will, by default, kick the issue back to the Federal Trade Commission, which, as Larry said, could have addressed this issue starting about 10 years ago. And then that really forces uh, Democrats to decide, do they really want to take the legislative deal that uh, Republicans offered them last year? And, and if they do, they may succeed in, in getting some version of the uh, issue back to the Federal Communications Commission, or they may get the Federal Trade Commission to have rulemaking power. But, but I think Larry's basically right. You're not going to see this issue change fundamentally. The, the 2010 rules were never really controversial at their core. And industry, if they had to, would sign up today to a, a self a regulatory pledge that would be enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. Now, Larry, there has been debate over the authority of the FCC 
in general, whether it's net neutrality or some other issues, do you think uh, that that authority uh, will again be questioned in a Trump administration? Yes, so I think so. I mean, the question has always been, in 1996, did Congress give the FCC any authority over broadband? And that's what we've really been fighting about for the last 10 years. Um, it's not really clear. Congress may step in now and make this much clearer, I think, than they did. That was part of the, the bill that, that Barron mentioned. Uh, the FCC may voluntarily sort of reinterpret it itself and say, no, we're going back to the version we had all along up until Chairman Wheeler. Uh, but that will definitely be a, a keystone of what the new FCC will do is to kind of re-examine its own authority and decide what did Congress really mean, what really is our limit. What about when it comes to M&A, Barron? I mean, uh, Trump has indicated he's not a fan of the AT&T Time Warner measure, but, you know, at best, what he, he believes, no, no one really knows. It, it's been a little confusing. Uh, there's been other analysis that Trump could be good for M&A, that a Sprint T-Mobile uh, could merge uh, in this era if they wanted to. Uh, how do you think the, the FCC, a Trump FCC, will weigh in on M&A issues? Uh, there's really no way to tell. We have to wait to see who becomes chairman and who takes over antitrust at the Department of Justice. But the people who actually follow these things are, in general, skeptical of, uh, of the need for government intervention and are, are generally more willing to, to let deals go through. And, and then if there are issues, if there are real demonstrated harms to consumers, to come up with conditions that would really respond to those instead of either blocking deals or using conditions just to, to regulate uh, without going through the normal process as the Obama administration has done. So I, I think probably we'll see deals more likely to go through, but it, it depends. And if you saw a wild card chairman come in that might follow through on what uh, Trump has tweeted about, maybe things would be different, but there's no way to tell at this point. Silicon Valley, Larry, is in an interesting position, having been so outspoken against Donald Trump, and yet these are some of the most valuable companies in the world. Uh, the Internet Association, which represents Amazon, Google, Netflix, uh, sent a letter to Trump asking and urging him to keep the Internet uh, open, uh, to keep it a level playing field. How do you see the relationship between Trump and the tech industry playing out? Do you think Trump risks alienating them even further uh, and, and to, to, their, to their detriment, perhaps? Yeah. Well, I hope not. Uh, you know, again, we don't really know. We have so little to go on. There was no real tech policy position by the Trump candidacy the way there was for Secretary Clinton. So most of this is, is a lot of speculation. But I think what we can hope for is that uh, Republicans, you know, are free trade. Silicon Valley likes things to be left unregulated. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully those things will align and the sort of character differences will work themselves out. Uh, Baron, w w one thing we do uh, potentially know is Trump's, <laughs> Trump's stance on immigration. We don't know necessarily how that would impact things like uh, the H-1B visa issue, but that is something that uh, obviously you know, tech companies very much rely on, they, they, that there are a lot of skilled immigrant workers that work at uh, technology companies in Silicon Valley. You know, you know, aside from M&A, aside from the FCC, you know, what are the sort of clues that you're looking at based on what Trump has said so far about how he will approach the tech industry? Uh, well, again, it's, it's anybody's guess. Uh, <laughs> there seems to be a certain battle going on for Trump's soul. And on the one hand, you have the Mike Pence traditional Republicans who are free trade and, and in, uh, in favor of uh, innovation and understand that high-skilled immigration is, is what makes San Francisco and the, and the tech center work. And it's what brings talented, smart people to the United States. Uh, and then on the other hand, you know, Steve Bannon um, has said things about there being too many Asians in the United States and, and that maybe it's a problem that um, for our, our civic society that uh, we need to do something about immigration. I mean, it's, it's, it's really unclear and I, I am not confident that we know what will happen, um, but we're going to have to see how this transition shakes out and, and what, what happens right now in this, this very tumultuous process. And for people who are wondering when we'll get some comfort, uh, when we'll know something, historically, these major appointments in the tech sector end up happening pretty close to inauguration. I mean, for example, the FCC chairman uh, was not named by Obama until uh, January 12th in 2009. Mm. Um, so 
it could be a while, and then issues like immigration, you know, we're, that's not an issue that is going to be determined by a single appointment. That's going to play out in Congress, and that could take a very long time. But if, if I were concerned about that, I would wait and see how much uh, the administration is willing to work with or, or even defer to Republicans on the Hill, because they get issues like immigration, and if they're the ones okay. driving the agenda, it's going to work out well. We're going to touch on that Steve Bannon story and his comments about Asian tech CEOs a little bit later this hour. Uh, Baron Soka, Tech Freedom President, also Larry Downs, uh, a longtime watcher of uh, FCC uh, action on net neutrality. Thank you so much for joining us. Tomorrow, we'll pick up this conversation and much more on the concerns of U.S. tech giants when we speak to Internet Association CEO Michael Beckerman. A story we have been watching, Microsoft has offered concessions to European Union regulators trying to smooth the way for the planned acquisition of LinkedIn. Europe's competition regulators started casting an eye over the mega merger, mega merger in October, investigating the business activities of the two firms to determine whether the proposed merger could be bad for competition. Microsoft announced the $26.2 billion deal back in June. Coming up, what a Trump presidency could mean for the price of an iPhone. We'll break down the numbers next. This is Bloomberg. President-elect Donald Trump campaigned on a promise to tax goods manufactured in China, potentially as high as 45 percent, part of a plan he believes will reinvigorate the United States and manufacturing by bringing it stateside. One company this could have a major impact on is Apple. A Chinese state-run newspaper warned of American warned Americans of countermeasures if Trump launched a trade war, including a tit-for-tat approach. Here with me to break it all down, what it could mean for Apple and other smartphone makers, Crawford Del Pret, uh, chief research officer at IDC. So, how much would uh, these tariffs impact Apple and? iPhone users. Yeah, so um, if you look at sort of how these tariffs would be would be levied, there would be negotiation whether it would be 45 percent, whether it would be 20 percent, whether it would be 15 percent. Um, that would be on what we call the OEM price or the or the, the, the original price of the product. So it's not going to be the $800 or $900 that end user sees. It would be something a lot a lot less than that. But just for the sake of the argument, let's say that you get down to a number of $35 or $40. In all likelihood, a company as uh, cash positive as Apple and generating what Apple uh, generates would likely eat that uh, hmm. charge. Um, and, you know, that would really be, you know, one of their few options. Another option, of course, would be to pass that along to the consumer uh, or to split that with carriers or to other channel partners they might be selling with. So, um, you know, again, it, 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 it definitely hurts the consumer in the right. long term. Would that be advisable given that you've got other smartphone makers out yeah. there right now making decent products for a lot cheaper? Right. So this is really, so Apple's kind of fighting a war on multiple fronts. They are the premium product. They are the premium ecosystem right now. They are not um, necessarily, you know, there's also a huge ecosystem in Android that they're competing with. But what's happening is that in the middle of the market, you're seeing uh, a lot of uh, Chinese and um, other offshore suppliers that are starting to move up and offer really premium products at mainstream price points. I mean, $299, $399, that's getting you four gigabytes of memory mm -hmm. and 32 gigabytes of, of storage and getting you premium battery experience and really strong products so you know if those products um, don't aren't necessarily affected in the same way mm -hmm. because those products you know those are not necessarily US based manufacturers that becomes yet another problem for Apple in this scenario that said, aren't most electronics manufactured outside the United States and if this happened wouldn't affect all of those whether it's Samsung or HTC, wouldn't yep. affect everyone equally. Absolutely. This is a global industry, and it's a global industry for a reason. And, you know, interestingly, there's so much automation in, say, semiconductor fabrication, the, the, the factory that you use to build uh, a semiconductor. You actually don't need that factory to be based offshore. That factory could be based here. The reason those are in Asia is because all the other assembly happens in Asia, mm -hmm. and it's more cost effective to have those factories close to the point of final manufacture. So, again, if you start saying, well, this company is the company I'm going to tax, that has downstream ramifications for all the parts right. that get assembled. Now, it's very complicated because Apple assembles the phones in China, yet there are parts of the process happening in Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, Absolutely. South Korea. So how realistic is it to bring manufacturing or some part of the manufacturing process back to the U.S.? How many jobs would that actually 
create. Yeah. It would be a relatively small number mm -hmm. um, because what would have to happen is that there would have to be a huge investment in robotics and in automation in order for that to happen in the United States. So you kind of start parsing words here. So what could happen could be that Apple could say, okay, we'll do final software load, we'll do final flash memory load, we'll glue the, the screen on at the last moment of manufacture in the US, and does that count as manufacturing? Would that count? Um, well, it depends on, you know, kind of, you know, where the lines get drawn. Um, this, you know, PC manufacturers have done some of that final configuration um, for years uh, in the US. You look at a company like CDW, that, that does final storage configuration and final software load in the United States. You know, does that count as manufacturing? It's really final configuration, um, but it does employ people to do that. Now, having said but that, but you're saying realistically, it's not going to be that. Realistically, many it's not going to be that many jobs, and also it would add cost to the supply chain because those semiconductor factories and those screen uh, factories and those um, uh, you know other electronics uh, assembly factories that are in Asia, those are not moving back anytime soon. So now you're adding transportation cost into the product. Quickly, how many jobs? Hundreds, thousands. Uh, the, thousands. The, you could potentially add. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, it would be. It, it could be measured in low thousands at, at the outside. Okay. Crawford Del Pret, Chief Research Officer, IDC. Always great to have you here on the show. Thanks. Thank you. A programming note: In this week's David Rubenstein show, David sits down with Alphabet Executive Chairman Eric Schmidt. Among other things, they discuss cybersecurity risks from Russia. Do you think the United States government is better at cyber terrorism, if it's, that's the right word, than other governments are against us? The one that I worry about the most about right now is actually Russia. If you look at their actions in the last few months, they've done a number of very publicized uh, invasions, attacks, and, and alterations, uh, which can only be understood as cyber, cyber activity, and they're not shy about it. They don't mind people knowing about it. So this must be part of their strategy to keep in our face, if you will. You can watch David Rubenstein's full conversation with Alphabet Executive Chairman Eric Schmidt, 8 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Television. More of Bloomberg Tech next. This is Bloomberg. China web giant Tencent reported earnings. Profit missed, but revenue beat. And that is thanks to three parts of the business. Smartphone games, performance-based ads, plus payment and cloud services. Peter Elstrom covers the company for Bloomberg News, joins me now from our Tokyo bureau. Uh, and Tencent has trying to sort of transform uh, the biggest revenue streams in its business. Peter, uh, how well is that going? Well, it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting quarter. The company boosted revenues more than 50%, so by almost any standard, that would be considered pretty strong growth. Uh, but at the same time, it's investing very heavily in some of these new ventures, and that's the reason that you saw net income rise a few notches more slowly than that. The company is, um, is uh, the, most, the dominant player in messaging services. Uh, through WeChat and then QQ. It's now investing more aggressively into cloud services, into new kinds of games and media content, into online payment systems too. So it has a bunch of new in initiatives that it's trying to invest in and expand its uh, revenue from here and also get out ahead of a slowing Chinese economy. Uh, messaging services, as you said, WeChat, QQ have been uh, essential to Tencent's growth. What are some of the trends uh, they're seeing there? Uh, any signs of slowing growth? Well, just for context, uh, WeChat has about uh, 840 million users, so that's about twice as many as Twitter, more than twice as many as Twitter. Uh, it's the most popular messaging service within China. Uh, Tencent also has the QQ messaging services. Now, the growth in those services is slowing a bit because they've, cut, they've now uh, been adopted by almost the whole population. Tencent is now focused on trying to monetize those more in a couple of different ways. One, they're selling more advertising through those uh, mediums as they, as they offer new services. And they're also marketing games and other kinds of digital goods through them. So they're very, very popular channels for all sorts of promotions. And Tencent is trying to take advantage of those. Now, Peter, Bloomberg has reported that a, a Trump presidency would have an outsized impact on Alibaba of all the Chinese tech giants. Uh, what might it mean for Tencent? Uh, that's right. It's probably more of an issue for Alibaba at this point. Tencent's business is almost entirely within China at this point. Um, it has ambitions to move beyond China. It recently bought uh, Supercell, the maker of Clash of Clans and Clash Royale. 
Uh, so it is selling some of these games globally, but uh, at this point it's been mostly focused on China. It has ambitions to expand in that direction, but it would sort of depend on how it executes that expansion. All right, Peter Elstrom, our Asia Tech Chief, joining us from Tokyo. Thank you so much, Peter, Thanks, uh, for weighing in. A story now that is trending. Some controversial comments from one of President-elect Trump's closest advisors are resurfacing. The Washington Post has highlighted an interview between Trump and Steve Bannon last year on the Breitbart News Network. The two men talked about foreign-born employees in the United States, specifically in tech. Bannon said, when two-thirds or three-quarters of the CEOs in Silicon Valley are from South Asia or from Asia, and a country is more than an economy, we're a civic society. Some interpreting that to mean he thinks there are too many Asian CEOs in tech. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech live streaming now on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV at 6 p.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.